Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Um, today I would like to start a new um, topic which is related to electromagnetic um, waves, um, but in particular the visible light. So we will talk about visible light, about certain rules or laws, um, the um, propagation of this light actually is supposed to obey. Um, so today's lecture will be very, very introductory. I'll just basically talk about light. There is no formulas or any kind of complicated calculations. Okay, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented on Unisor.com. I recommend you to um, watch this lecture from the Unisor.com because um, every lecture is complemented by very detailed text, which is basically like a textbook for this particular lecture. Um, also, um, the, uh, the site contains um, a preliminary course, if you wish to call it, um, which is definitely a necessary to uh, study or to know, actually, before you study physics. It's called Math for Teens. Um, whatever the um, mathematical knowledge we need to study physics, and there is a lot, it's all presented in that course, in the preliminary course, Math for Teens, which basically stands on its own, obviously. Okay, now the website is completely free. There are no advertisements, there are no financial um, uh, strings, there are no monetary benefits to, to anybody, even sign-in is not really um, necessary, unless you will get involved in a little bit more detailed um, um, study under supervision of somebody, or maybe supervision of yourself, that's also possible, then you might need actually the sign-on. But sign-on is just basically the name and password. Okay, so, I have certain topics which I would like to talk about today. First, what is light? Well, right now we can say that light is the oscillations of electromagnetic field, electromagnetic waves. Um, it's transversal, and we were talking about before. And um, what do we need to know about waves? Well, first of all, um, we need to know the frequency, right? Um, we might actually have to ask about what's the speed of uh, propagation of these lights. And I can tell you, uh, we are talking about only the light which is, uh, which is visible, which means our eye, which is a very sensitive instrument actually, um, can sense. Well, apparently not every electromagnetic oscillations can be sensed by our um, senses, um, in particular by our eyes. We are talking about certain range of frequencies of these electromagnetic waves which we can sense. And the frequencies are from 4 times 10 to 14 hertz oscillations per second to 8 times 10 to 14 hertz. So electromagnetic waves with the range of frequencies within these boundaries is can be sensed by our eyes. I mean, obviously, different people sense it differently. This is approximation, or average, whatever it is. Average minimum and average maximum frequency. It, usually, children uh, have more sensitive eyes, and they might actually see even below and above this range. But this is kind of a, <laughs> a agreed upon range um, that we can actually call this is a visible light. So frequency is number of periods per second. Okay, great. Now, um, the second uh, parameter which we might actually uh, think about is the so this is f lambda is 
uh, wavelengths. So what's the wavelengths? What's the length of one period in meters, basically, right? Well, for this, we need to know the speed of light. So if speed of light, speed of light is um, distance the front of the waves covers per, let's say, per second. So it's meters per second, for instance. And this is called C, usually abbreviated as C. Now, approximately, I will give you the exact number, but right now you can say that approximately it's 3 uh, times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So this is the speed. So in one second, speed covers the distance of 3 to the 10 to the 8 um, meters. Now, if frequency is certain number of oscillations or periods, if you wish, per second, so if you will divide C by F, this is total distance, which is covered in one second. And so the length of one particular um, period would be this divided by number of periods per second, which is frequency. So lambda would be in the range of 375 times 10 to the minus 9 to 750 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. Now, uh, 10 to the minus 9 meter is 1 nanometer. So you can say that it's from 375 to 750 nanometers. These are wavelengths. So whenever the frequency is less, we have longer um, wavelengths. Whenever the frequency is greater, we have shorter. So this is basically what light is. I mean, you can also say something about period, which is actually 1 over f. But this is rarely used. Um, this is basically um, how much time actually to cover one particular period. That, that's rarely used characteristic. So the frequency and wavelengths and the speed are major characteristics of visible light. And this is basically what we are talking about. <coughs> One interesting detail, C does not depend on frequency. So for any frequency, speed is the same. But that's a separate story. OK, so this is all about um, what actually light is. Now, we do sense the light, but we sense it differently. Depending on the frequency in this range, we see the light in colors. Well, at least those people who can do it. There are some people who cannot distinguish colors. This is an illness kind of thing. But generally speaking, people do differentiate the colors. So the shorter frequencies, the shorter frequency, the, the higher frequencies, the shorter wavelengths. So this part, this part, is towards the violet. Uh, end of the spectrum, and the uh, um, lower frequency and um, longer waves uh, are for red side of the spectrum. And everything in between actually has, generally speaking, we know which range of frequencies correspond to which color, but it's not really a discrete uh, change of the color from one to another. It's a very gradual one. And uh, in the text for this particular lecture on unizor.com, I actually have a picture, color from, um, from violet to, to red, represented with approximately boundaries where we consider 
end of the one color and beginning of another color. But again, this is just our um, view towards colors. Colors are not really like violet, uh, blue, green, etc. Colors are gradually changing from one to another. It's our feelings, how we sense these colors, um, we, we, which we are talking about right now. So there is no abrupt change. Okay, this is red and, and, and this is uh, yellow, for instance. No, it's very gradually changing and if you will see the picture which I um, put into the textual part uh, of, this, uh, of this course, of this particular lecture, you will see how the color is changing and where we are putting boundaries between the different colors. Now, everything uh, less frequent than red is usually called infrared and from our eyes it's, it's, it's basically black, we don't see it and uh, everything more frequently than uh, violet is called ultraviolet and we, it, and we also don't see it, so it's also like black. And that's why that picture which I'm talking about, which I present in the notes for this lecture, it has black top and black bottom. And in between, gradually is changing from violet to, to blue to whatever, green, etc to the red. <coughs> so this is all about colors. Now, and again, color is our subjective um, representation of different feelings which, I, w w which we have based on different frequencies or different wavelengths of the visible light. Okay? Now, what about speed? Well, speed is an interesting thing. It's a separate story about how scientists were trying to measure the speed of light. Speed of light is very, very high. More than that, according to the theory of relativity, speed of light in vacuum is the fastest possible speed to achieve. So it's fast and it's very difficult, therefore, to, to, to measure. And there were many very ingenious experiments um, as a result of which we have an exact um, uh, number for uh, what is the speed of light. So let me just put this number up and I'll talk about this a little bit. So this is approximation. Exact value is two nine nine comma seven nine two comma four five eight meters per second. That was determined well some time ago. <coughs> and yes, there are certain experiments which basically gave us this number. But then, uh, physicists came up with a system of units which is called CSI, System International. Now, in this um, system of units, there are certain fundamental units, like meter for measurements of the distance, second for measurement of the time, and kilogram for measurements of the mass. Now, these fundamental units must be obtained from somewhere. For example, meter some time ago was basically the length of piece of metal actually, which was stored somewhere at certain condition, at certain temperature in Paris in some kind of an organization, government organization. But obviously that is not as precise as um, contemporary measurements actually supposed to be. So, what physicists decided to do is to have some fundamental constant which is basically available in nature. And using this constant, 
define our main units of measurements. So, what they have decided with the meter, which is the unit of distance, they have decided that we will take the speed of light in vacuum and one over this number would be by definition called the length of one meter. That's why the speed of light is exactly this particular number because meter is defined through this particular number. Okay, it's not an approximation, this is exact. Similarly, when we are talking about second, I mean, how can you store the uh, some kind of a equivalent of one second so people can measure against it? I mean, it's kind of difficult. So they have decided to have some fundamental physical constant um, and uh, in this particular case it was related to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, radioactive decomposition of cesium, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Um, and again, the time during which certain radiation actually occurs, or part of that particular time, w was called a second. So basically, we do try to relate our fundamental units uh, of certain physical um, characteristics to some constants which exist in nature. And this is one of the constants, speed of light, speed of electromagnetic waves in vacuum is a constant, well, according to our theories right now. <laughs> that's another story. Uh, and that's how we define. So this is the speed of light. Now, what's interesting is, I mentioned a couple of times that this is the speed of light in vacuum. And um, I would like to actually mention that speed of light in different other substances or environments is different. And just as an example, I think I have in glass, speed of light in glass is 2.25 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. You see? Less than this. It's about 1 and 1 third, approximately. So, speed of light is definitely related to substance within which it propagates. So, the glass or water about the same thing um, uh, has uh, less speed of light than in vacuum. Vacuum is the highest and again according to theory of relativity it is by theory the highest possible um, speed which can be achieved. It's related to increasing of the mass for instance of the object which is moving with this speed and mass goes to infinity there are obviously certain mathematical equations where um, mass depends on the speed and uh, uh, we might actually talk about this uh, after this uh, course at the very end maybe if I will have some time we'll talk about theory of relativity but in, 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 in according to this theory with increasing of the speed towards this particular number the mass is increasing to infinity and that's why it's impossible to exceed to exceed Okay, that's the speed. Now, what is the source of light? I have listed a few sources in my um, notes for this lecture. Well, obviously we all know about, for instance, burning. So if you will burn the wood. Uh, now, what is burning? Burning is a chemical reaction of oxi uh, oxidation. So some, uh, ba basically it's something like this. So the molecules of um, um, carbon are connected to molecules of oxygen and as a result we have um, carbon dioxide. But during this we have energy distributed and this energy in 
uh, in the form of heat and light, which we see. So that's why whenever we are burning the wood or, or coal, for instance, we see the light. Now, that's the chemical. Now, electricity can be the source. Um, when you have an incandescent lamp, <coughs> it's very intense flow of electrons through the metal, um, whatever metal spring is inside, um, like usually it's tangent uh, or some kind of alloy made with tangent. And uh, because of the intensity of electrons which are going through this um, I forgot the name of this, well, I'll call it spiral. Okay, uh, the intensity of electrons is so, it, uh, it, it's so big that it actually heats up this uh, piece of tangent. And uh, when it heats up, it actually emits energy again in terms of um, heat and, uh, and visible light. So that's electric. Um, what else? Well, nuclear reaction. Our sun. Now, there is a nuclear reaction which is happening on the sun constantly. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's a fission and it's a fusion, basically. Fission of um, some very heavy elements and fusion of light elements. And in both cases, um, we will produce a lot of heat and uh, and visible light and invisible light as well obviously so whenever you see the sun for instance you see only the visible spectrum but yes there are a lot of electromagnetic waves which are coming out from the same sun which you don't see these are in ultraviolet or infrared uh, parts of the spectrum of electromagnetic uh, waves. Cosmic radiation, for instance, also is important, but we don't see it because, again, the frequency of, um, of these cosmic rays is much, much higher than the range which we, uh, which we can sense. Um, now, there is a <coughs> luminescence um, process, whatever, effect. Um, uh, we know that sometimes if you look at the sea at night, you see that it lights up. <coughs> Excuse me. That's basically some kind of animal, whatever, or in, I, I don't know how, how they're called. But they emit the light. They absorb the light during the daytime, like an energy is absorbed, and then release it later at night. So this is a luminescence. Now we have a phosphorescence, we have fluorescence and we have chemiluminescence. These are all different kinds of the same thing. Now, um, what's important, another very important uh, um, way of producing light, it's relatively recent invention called LED, light emitting diodes. Um, so all the streets, for instance, in, in New York, where I live right now, are lit by the lamp which are based on LED technology. Um, it's something related to electronics. There are special kinds of light emitting diodes. They're very low energy uh, consumption, but a lot of light. So that's very, they're very good from the energy consumption standpoint. So these are all different sources of, um, of light. And the last thing which I wanted actually to talk about, um, and I'm not really very comfortable in this, quite frankly, because it's a very, very complicated manner. Um, the history of our view um, onto light. In the beginning, it was relatively simple. In the beginning, light was considered as basically a set of small corpuscles or particles basically that's the view of uh, Isaac Newton for instance so they were viewing he and some other people they were viewing light as just a flow of certain particles 
and there were experiments actually um, which can confirm it. For example, um, something like a reflection from the mirror. Well, the reflection of the mirror, obviously, we see it's something like this. If this is the mirror, so it's basically exactly like if you will have tennis balls and you will throw it in this direction, it will go that well. So that's why the particle theory is the simplest one and well, kind of the most natural to come up with if you don't know anything about electromagnetism, electromagnetism or anything like that. Later on, <coughs> there were certain experiments which basically could not be explained within the framework of the corpuscular um, theory. And um, these experiments are related, for instance, um, like this. If you have source of light here, and this is just a small hole, well, you would see that the if it's a if it's just a set of particles, now these particles will not go, and these particles will go. So who will see these particles? Well, the person who is here. What about the person who is here? Well, actually, person who is here actually see something like a light, maybe not as bright, but still sees it. How can it be explained if the particles are going only this way within with the whatever whatever the, uh, the this small sp uh, small hole actually is and there are some other experiments diffraction uh, interference etc which people observed but could not explain within the framework but they are very very well explained within the wave theory so if light is a wave like sound for instance consider this is a source not of light but a sound and these are soundproof walls with a small uh, hole. Well, the sound will go here, but these people will hear the sound. Why? Because the oscillation of the air here will be propagated in all directions. So that's why um, other scientists like Huygens, for instance, um, they have suggested that, well, maybe the light is just oscillation of some um, some substance um, which is oscillating like air is transmitting the sound this substance which we don't really see we don't really know what it is but it transmits the waves of, uh, of the light this sus substance was called ether and uh, I think it's spelled like this ether and um, and that was also a very plausible theory. I mean, it explained a lot, including the properties of reflection, for instance, and some other properties. So this theory actually dominated for quite some time. Well, but then the problem was with ether, because there was no experiment which can prove that ether actually exists, like air, for instance, is uh, the substance which, which transmits the sound waves, we know what air is. I mean, we definitely feel its pressure, etc. With ether, there was absolutely nothing. At the same time, um, uh, Maxwell, who was actually, Faraday actually, and Maxwell, they were investigating electromagnetic waves. At that time, the electromagnetic waves theory was actually developed. And, uh, for instance, Maxwell uh, came up with uh, equations which basically explain how the whole electromagnetic field behaves. And uh, they were theoretically actually uh, coming up with um, something like speed of uh, electromagnetic waves, which by that time uh, approximately was equal to the speed of um, light propagation. And that's why they have suggested that maybe the light is actually the oscillation of electromagnetic field. And oscillation of electromagnetic field, now if you remember back to um, concepts of uh, magnetic induction, etc., elect 
electric field, a variable electric field, is producing variable magnetic field, variable magnetic produces variable electric, etc., etc., and that's how the light propagates. In vacuum, you, you don't really need any kind of ether to, to transmit these waves. They are self-transmitting, so to speak. They are uh, moving themselves. Um, and uh, so that was the period when people kind of agreed that light is actually the oscillations of electromagnetic field, electromagnetic waves. Well, and uh, the last component of this was the quantum theory, um, which actually explains some, some corpuscular properties of light. Um, so these properties, light as a particle, do exist, but to explain them in, from the purely wave theory was very difficult. So the quantum mechanics actually introduce certain concepts like photon, for instance, which without um, contradicting the wave theory, added the component of um, particularity or corpuscularity of the light. So there are certain characteristics which are significant from the pattern, fr fr from the um, particle standpoint, they were explained in quantum theory. And that's kind of a contemporary way where it is. Again, I'm not actually comfortable right now to get into all the details of this. Well, number one, because I probably don't know all the details myself, and secondly, it doesn't, definitely doesn't belong to this course, for, which is basically a kind of introduction to the real physics. Um, but nevertheless, it's a very interesting theory, and you might actually read about um, how people were measuring the speed of light, how one theory uh, changed another theory. There are many famous names involved, like, for instance, Newton, Huygens, uh, Einstein, Max Planck, etc. So all these uh, stories are very interesting from the, you know, history of science standpoint. And I do actually recommend you to read, you might actually like it. All right, so that was an introductory to what basically light is all about. And the real properties of light we will start addressing in next lectures. So thank you very much. I do suggest you to read um, the notes for this lecture. Look at the picture with colors which I put into notes. And uh, good luck. Thank you.